Aloha and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution uh, here on thinktechhawaii.com. I'm your host, I'm Peter Rossing. This is a program where we talk about micro mobility, essentially rolling, scooting, walking as a way to get around uh, and avoid the automobile if possible. So um, today we have our guest, Anthony Chang, who's been here before uh, talking about some traffic issues before as well. Uh, Anthony is a uh, is an avid bicyclist and actually makes a small business of of it, I believe. And uh, he recently wrote a piece for the Honolulu Star Advertiser about that uh, that darn uh, Alawai Bridge, the pedestrian cyclist bridge that's gotten a lot of discussion lately. So, Anthony, welcome to the program. Mahalo for having me, Peter, again, and thank you for everyone who is tuning in, and whether you're listening to me for the first time or you've listened to me before, I also appreciate your time. Thank you. Well said. I appreciate the time, too. I have my two regular uh, my two regular listeners out there, but I'm not sure who else is out there, but uh, let's press forward. You just wrote a, a piece, so it's uh, published in the Star Advertiser, about the, the bridge. And um, I imagine you know the first sentence by heart by now. So what, did, what was the first, what was the lead? What was the first thing you said? Our, our arguments, well, I'm probably summarizing. Arguments against the Aloha Bridge are anti-democratic, anti-deport, and not grounded in democracy or reality. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, when I, uh, I I worked for the newspaper for a long time, and uh, one of the frustrating things about writing for the newspaper is you never get to write your own headlines. So the headline of the story, at least the one on the uh, online version, was uh, pedestrian bridge would be an asset. Uh, and uh, so let's take that for a moment. Uh, rather than, you know, talk about what's anti-democratic or... Uh, irrational when we talk about planning. Let's talk about what do you see are the positives? What's, why is this uh, such a good thing? And before we jump into that, I want to say I've been an enthusiast and a supporter of this version of this bridge for uh, many years. And um, uh, so uh, it's not that I'm opposed to it, but I'm, I'm you know interested in all the controversy that's surrounded. So let's start with the positives. What's the good thing what are the good things about this uh bridge if, when it gets built it will create a safer and more convenient crossing for people who walk and bicycle the current crossings as i mentioned in my op-ed the cross uh, the sidewalks often are very narrow and sometimes are difficult for people, especially if you have like a wheelchair or just need more space to cross, definitely not more, more than enough room for one person to walk across. So there's that bit. This is both Kapakulu side and Macaulay Street for people wondering how to get from Mo'ili to Waikiki. And the bike lanes on the Macaulay side ra disappear at random points getting into Waikiki. They are non-existent on Kapokulu. The Alawai Bridge addresses this. Pedestrian, bicycling only, therefore 100% safe. And because it's such a short crossing, should be accessible for most people who have, you know, even if they have energy issues. Okay, so... You would say safety, convenience uh, are the are the main main things. Yes, and I, as I touched upon it in the opinion editorial, makes it more equitable. As I mentioned, there is data that shows that seventeen, nearly seventeen percent of households on Oahu are carless. Nearly seventy seven zero percent of those people are would be considered low income by federal standards. So not all of us, unfortunately, can afford the automobile to go across. And even for those who can, they just might want to walk and, and bike across, but they don't feel con um, safe to do so because yes, of all the problems I just addressed previously. Okay. So just to review, the, the, there are basically three ways to get across the Alawai right now. Uh, you can come down Kapahulu, which is 
skirts the Alawai. Uh, and although there's not a bike lane on top of the little proper, there is a, a bike lane along the golf course. Uh, there's the uh, Kalakaua uh, extension that goes, or the Alawai extension that runs up to Kalakaua Avenue and then goes right. And there's, a, I guess that's a bridge uh, right before the convention center. And then there's the McCulley Bridge. Is that it? And that, that those are, well, aren't those enough? No, there are, there are shared use paths up going up Kalakaua past the Alawai, but there are patches, I want to say, of Kapolulu Avenue. Definitely no shared use path, definitely narrow crosswalks. Again, really inconvenient. And you're not going to see a lot of people. You're definitely not going to see a lot of cyclists on the road. Um, I have seen some people walk their bikes. Not convenient for a cyclist, obviously, because if you're cycling, you want to stay on your bike as much as possible, not just like walk and push your bike. And same thing on the Macaulay side. I've seen a lot of cyclists. That was actually my early days too. I, I as someone who spends a lot of time on the road doing deliveries, I do feel comfortable doing it, but I understand that I am not probably like 98, 99% of people. During my early days when I was bicycling, back when I was just only using Beakly, Beaky, shout out to Beaky, um, I only, I often just got on the sidewalk and walked my bike across just to get into Waikiki, which unfortunately is not very, you know, it's a telling, telling how, how unsafe I felt and definitely not convenient if you have to walk your bike across. Yeah, I guess I've done this route myself and I used to uh, more frequently do the the bike route that goes basically uh, along the Alawai on the on the Malka side and then down Alawai on the Mackay side and does cross at the McCulley Bridge and the McCulley Bridge is awful. Uh, McCulley is awful. I mean McCulley is a street uh, that's uh, you know four lanes wide I guess and seems to always have six lanes of traffic on it. So uh, I, I I sympathize with that idea, although uh, you know some people raise the question of why it's needed. But I think you make the case uh, that it's uh, not a huge distance down. If you're on the Alawai and the University Avenue, the end there, uh, it's not a huge way to go to Macaulay or a huge way to go to Kapalulu, but it's it's an inconvenience, and it does uh, I'm sure discourage the people from from taking the bike there. So um, I could get into it too. The other thing I thought about too is if you do walk or bike, <laughs> there's a long ways between Kapolulu and Macaulay, especially by foot, never mind by bicycle. Sorry also to the Alawai Canal. That is a terrible bike lane. No offense to any, whoever designed it because it's, it's next to like 200 cars or cars. Never mind the traffic that is definitely going to fly by you at 35 miles per hour. But cyclists are often concerned that a door will open up on them suddenly. And if you're biking, blasting really fast, that it could lead to, um, it could, if you hit the door straight on, it'll lead to an injury, but the door could also knock you into traffic, which is going to cause a lot of other injuries. And just having a more central route to get into university, Macaulay would be Again, safer and more convenient for the reasons why I get. It's not as long of a route. And there are already a lot of people actually who bicycle and walk actually on the other side, the Malka side of the Alawai Canal. It just kind of like adds to that traffic, but there already is a, there is a good amount, at least all the times I've ever biked and, biked and walked by. Yeah. And uh, on speaking of the Alawai, I mean, either you're in that bike lane going with traffic, waiting for a door to open in front of you, or you have, you're on the sidewalk, which is problematic for, because uh, it's not really a sidewalk for mixed use. And it's also uh, not straight. You have to curve around every, uh, every palm tree and so forth. So it's not, uh, depending on which way you're going, you're either coming up behind pedestrians or you're coming down in front of them. Uh, but there is a plan to improve that, I think, is there not? There's going to be, uh, we don't know when, but, you know, there's a plan to improve, uh, move the, the park cars on the LOI in and create a bike lane on the other side. Isn't, isn't that coming sometime? 
I don't wouldn't bull estimate the timetable as I am not a planner for Department of Transportation Services or Complete Streets. They do have that in the works. There's supposedly supposed to be something like a two-way bike lane, at least for parts of it or some of it, and they're gonna get get rid of I believe the estimate is about twenty percent of the parking to create enough space for that. Yeah. Uh, and I also want to mention, yeah, it's folks do not it is illegal to bicycle on sidewalks, which is the sidewalk next to all the Y canal. So I, I usually don't. And there is, there's a lot of people who do walk and jog and do other things through. So I, I take my chances with the bike lane. Uh, it sometimes it actually gets even congested on that bike lane. Sometimes I'll just take the road. I'll take the right lane and I'll just plat. I'll just plat myself there, taking the lane, so to speak. So I will get to. Bike lane, despite how bad it is, it is used. Yeah. When we'll get to the struggle over losing 20 parking spaces some other time. I'm sure there'll be a protest about that. But uh, going back to what you said, you, you said something like 17% of the people on Oahu do not have automobiles. Is that right? Yeah. There's a study from Brookings Institute. I, if I had a way, I would put a link up on it. But the state of Hawaii also data book through the U.S. Census also, they track carless population. They track zero car, um, zero car households. And they can also tell you how many of them are poor, too, based on people who responded. So yeah. all the data is out there. Yeah. That's and not I, where Brookings pulled it from, actually. They probably, yeah. the census. I doubt they just did, they did a study around the water. So I would also guess, just on experience, that uh, many of the households in the uh, Moilele Macaulay area, which is pretty congested, are those uh, households without cars. And also many of the uh, people, the residents of Waikiki, who we often forget about, but I, I think if I remember, 35, 40,000 people live full time in Waikiki where parking is difficult. And then if you move on up University Avenue, you've got the university population, many of whom don't have a, a vehicle, uh, either by choice or by, you know, consequence. So my guess would be that the people on both sides of this bridge are among the uh, the communities, or those communities are among those that have uh, the most people without automobiles. You think that makes sense? It's hard for me. At university side, I could believe the average amount of cars per household on Oahu is two. I have seen data that you get when you get more to our town, it shrinks down to one. Therefore, by a statistical probability, statistical averages, yes, there are probably more zero by inference, more zero households when you get toward town. Because it's also just going to be, you know, the 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 some there's probably a few households up to forbid three cars that you get the idea from there the averages but the average is going to be it's either going to probably the amount of people who own one car or less definitely gets higher when you get to four town or less you know zero All right, well uh you're very talking efficient and I, I i go by the seat of my pants but uh anyway um so let's look a little bit at some of the the opposition uh you know there is always opposition uh, to projects like this, like rail, like anything. I worked for Hawaiian Electric for 20 years, and if you wanted to put up a, a poll, you had that, you, of course, you had to have a community meeting, as you should, and of course, there were people who turned out and said, oh, that will block my view, and so forth. Uh, when you look at the, the as a planner yourself, but if you look at the, the complaints or the, the opposition or the arguments, are there any there that are, at all convincing to you? Are there any there that you say, well, you know, maybe they're maybe they have a point? First off, I want to go back to my opinion or editorial. My first word of the first sentence is arguments. So I got some comments that Anthony, you shouldn't name call people. I have not. And if you were, if I knew where, if I knew you oppose a bridge, rest assured, I'm still very friendly, approachable. I've had people who debate with me, and I'm usually you know, pretty nice with them, but I am going to, I arguments, I'm sorry, but don't have feelings, don't have rights. You're entitled to your argument, but I, I still will treat you with, you know, as a human being with respect and kindness that you deserve. That's good. But 
let's go ahead. You know, we, we can argue about that for a long time about, but let's talk about the bridge. So are, are any of the arguments or any of the comments that you heard at the meeting or that you, uh, you, you got, uh, I didn't like it. I didn't think the comments you got on the, the piece were, were good and nobody signed their name. So I tend to just let those go, but it, it, is there, there you know, is there any of the opposition that you think, well, you know, maybe they have a point or uh, I wonder how we can, if there's a way to deal with that. Anything at all? Okay. The stuff about a bringing crime is not based on evidence, as I kind of addressed on my in editorial. There are complaints about its design which I'll be fair, I actually don't have strong opinions about. They want to get rid of the sail thing and stick columns into the water. There is an argument that it will impact paddlers. However, there are columns on the Macaulay Bridge and the paddlers seem to be navigating it through. So there is some criticism about the design, even though the principle is good. So there's that bit. That's a legitimate thing. I, but I, as a, as a planner, I only think about the public good, you know, so I don't think about aesthetics. I, will it benefit this community as a net? Yes. And if I may, Peter, there is one argument that is based on evidence that has not been touched upon that people have not brought up. If I, if you want to, if, if you want me to share it. Share it. Thought. Yeah. So projects like this tend to lead toward gentrification. If you are worried that it, it is going to make your rent more expensive and price you out of Mo'ili Ili or Waikiki, that complaint would be legitimate because there are studies and evidence, unfortunately, that like support this stuff. We, you know, the cost of living on Hawaii is really high. I, I should stop smiling, but I'm just, I'm smiling because it's just an argument that hasn't brought it up. But th projects like this do, there were people are worried about their property value, property values dropping with the increase in crime, it will actually probably be the reverse. Your property values will likely increase and that might make your rent more cheap, uh, more expensive, excuse me, you know, assuming you don't have a lockdown, you know what I mean, with a mortgage or something like that, your monthly payments. And so there's that. And, but that's a longer term effect that is harder to place, but it, it, it this has historically been true. The most, yeah. you know, complete streets, they tend to be gentrification projects, many major transportation works tend to be um gentrifiers notorious gentrifiers so oh, i've heard that one, actually it's so yeah there are there is a, a complete streets plan for university avenue to also increase the the bike lanes and and, and um so if it is gentrification or uh that it's it's coming you know bridge or not but the bridge is part of of that that plan i guess for me uh you know the the, the aesthetics do matter, and uh, I I look at the pictures of those of that uh, uh, sail, if that's what it is, and and it doesn't uh, it doesn't warm my heart. What can I say? It doesn't. Uh, I I do take aesthetics into account. That it seems like too much. Uh, I I work for Hawaiian Electric, as I've said, and uh, I work with a lot of engineers, and engineers tend to over engineer. In my experience. They want the gold-plated solution rather than something that is, is adequate. So it does bother me a bit that this thing is turned into much bigger uh, physically than than it was that I envisioned it in my mind. I envisioned something like the Macaulay Bridge, but done a little better with why you know than the Macaulay Bridge has turned out to be. Uh, is there anything that can be done about that? Do you think as a planner, is it too late to? Uh, modify that design, or do you think it's do you think it's a done deal? By the way, there was also I think I mentioned a bicycling and pedestrian bridge in Chinatown. Actually, I can almost like if there wasn't if the Chinese cultural plaza wasn't my way, I'd go see that bridge. <laughs> and that yeah. that design is actually if you saw see it, it, it is much simpler. Um, a lot of this is there it would i think where there's a political will there is a political way a lot of this is politics driven sorry this bridge infrastructure projects in my opinion should not be political no i don't think it's too late to change design with enough political groundswell it can change however because 60 percent of the design is is already complete if we change the design at this point people are already complaining about the cost of the bridge 
if we change the design, the cost will go up and not like in a small kind way. I mean, you almost kind of have to like go from scratch. Hopefully they have a, you know, backup design just sitting about, but even then it's probably not like in depth, like, you know, it went to architects or engineer scrutiny. In all likelihood, we will lose much of the money that has already gone into the design of the project and it will be expensive to redesign. But yes, it is possible. It can be done with enough. You know, if you message your mayor, your city council, whoever enough, the, uh, if there's enough, even, even civil servants, which I am, but I, I don't work on the project, thankfully. Right. I, I, I would love to work on the project, but um, I don't work on this project, so no conflict of interest. But us, we as civil servants, we, we care about public opinion. We care about public pushback. We listen and read about it. And as extravagant as some projects you, people feel like have been, <laughs> they might have been more without, without the pushback. And we listen to, but we listen to, but we listen to the people we serve. That's it. I, I am not privy. I saw like I, I work, you know, I, I, I wasn't the civil servant on this project. I haven't read. I've gone to a couple community meetings. I voiced my support for the project. I am a stakeholder as a small business person, as a delivery person who spends probably at least 60% of his weekend shift bicycling up and down Waikiki and Oili Ili. So though I'm not a resident, I am a stakeholder. I came in and I shared my piece and never have I actually ever touched upon the design of the project. I just want it to happen. I just, I want a better bicycling and walking crossing, especially considering our current situation. Yeah, that's fair. And I think, and I respect you for, uh, first of all, for clearing that up. If anybody thought that you were uh, in some kind of great conflict of interest or that you worked on the project, and also because you put your opinion out there and you signed your name to it, which to me is, is an act of bravery. Uh, whether I agree with you, and in this, in this case I do, or I disagree with you, if you're going to express an opinion in a public forum like the newspaper, uh, put your name on it. And uh, if any of those comments that uh, followed your article or any others, if they want to be treated with respect, they need to put their, their names on it as well. So uh, I, I give you kudos for doing that and for, uh, you know, frankly, not holding back. I don't think anybody... Uh, will miss the point of your article that you're all for this for this bridge. And I responded to those comments on my day. You can actually see Anthony Chang, you know, like it, behind. I didn't hide behind a fake name or a pseudonym or anything like that. You know, it, it, you could maybe wonder if it was really me and is this someone in the person to me be me? But no, that was me. That's Anthony Chang. There is the, Anthony Chang, the commenter, and Anthony Chang, the author, are one and the same for this article. Yeah. That I, as I say, that that is worthy of respect, and I do agree that the bridge ought to be built. I guess I have my some reservations. I, I guess the bridge would also it's going to be about twenty feet wide, uh, if I get the information correctly. And I and um, I wonder about uh, you. You see any possibility or any danger uh, of kind of a, a conflict on the bridge between uh, you know pedestrians. Um, some of whom will be pushing strollers and so forth. Uh, between that, those folks had people on traditional bicycles pedaling, and then the electric bike folks, I think, oh, well, you're one. Do you think that's uh, going to be a problem? Uh, is there any way to deal with, if you do, is there any way to deal with that problem? One of the things the city could do better is make it evident what is the speed limit for a bicycle for a shared use path, which is this is the legal and legal equivalent offer. Well, I was wondering what a shared use path is. That is a path that is legal, but but it often looks like a sidewalk. But uh, some shared use path examples, some easy ones to pick up. The state capital, technically not a sidewalk, shared use path, a path that goes through Honolulu Holly. The Diamond Head side, where the zoo goes up cop up to Kapahulu, up to Alawai, those are all legally shared use paths. And they could just put up shared use path, you know, speed limit, nine miles, you know, nine miles per hour, less than 10 miles per hour. And there, but I would argue it's relative. I, if a pedestrian, most people were walking, if they had to choose, it would it would be horrible if um, to get hit by a, as um, hit by a bicyclist if you were walking. But 
you'll probably survive. You'll be upset. You might get in an injury, but you'll live, especially if you get, you know, just relative to getting hit by a car, which is something that is more possible, especially on the Macaulay side, a couple of Hulu side too at various points where I've had some people actually just kind of like, they've had to hop. They wanted to be polite and get out of the person's way. They kind of hopped into the street, which is not, not okay. But yeah, I, I, I think there, yeah. Can there be a conflict? Yes, but it doesn't have to one and it won't be as serious as the automobile versus pedestrian and cycling conflict. And hopefully with a bit more education or vacation, it'll change people's behaviors. Yeah. Well, that's a hopeful attitude and I, I agree with it. I think as people get used to uh walking and, and scooting and rolling through these mixed use areas, uh, multiple use areas that uh, people will get used to it. They certainly have gotten used to it in Europe. It didn't happen overnight, but uh, you see cities like Copenhagen and, and Oslo and others, uh, Stockholm, where somehow, and you know, there are accidents, of course, uh, fr from time to time and everywhere in Amsterdam, but by and large, people have gotten used to it. It just doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. And at a local level, during during what is like work rush hour, you get a lot of people walking and bicycling on the Honolulu Halle and state capitol grounds. As far as I know, there haven't, I mean, yeah, there haven't, thank God forbid, any deaths, but definitely no, like, you know, permanent injuries, nothing that like cripples people, I don't know. Now, this is, this is, a, there's a lot of people, I know this because I, it's about the time I go home, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people walking and bicycling on that shared use path during rush hour as well. And same thing. I'm sure people got used to it. Maybe I, it, there, there is a complaint. I probably not enough to check to warrant the change. You know, I, that, I haven't, I haven't seen, I think on the state capitol at one point they were even discussing like a dedicated like bike path. Now, but that never happens. And here we are. You know, I guess it wasn't it didn't warrant enough for again, if there was enough political will for it, my opinion it would have would have happened. And it hasn't, probably just because there aren't enough conflicts for it to happen. Well, let's hope that's true. Anthony, thank you so much. We're running out of time. I really appreciate your your coming on and talking about this. And I think we've had a great exchange. Uh not just what's great about the the uh the bridge, which I think we both agree on. But uh, trying to figure out if there's some way to, to make make it better uh, and to make it more palatable, even to the people who are opposed to it. But I really appreciate your commentary. I'm sure you spoke at the meeting uh, and your commentary in the, the Star Advertiser and your your commitment to uh, to cycling is is to me very uh, very honorable and very much to be praised. So I want to thank you for coming on the program again, and um, I'm going to. Go now to our micro-mobility moment, which is uh, how I end uh, most of our shows. Uh, this is a repeat if you're uh, a regular viewer, uh, but here is uh, there, if you're thinking about an electric bike, uh, I really encourage you to go to this site uh, and uh, the, the League of American Bicyclists and People for Bikes, two national organizations, have put together an e-bike uh, education program. And so you before you maybe go to your the local bike shops, which are some of which are terrific and will help you out, uh, spend some time on this site and uh, learn a little bit more about electric bikes. You learn about how you should behave. Uh, this is the kind of education we were just talking about. It's not just pedestrians, it's cyclists who need to be, uh, and drivers, everybody needs to be educated. So I really encourage you to take advantage of this. And the last picture here, I will show this for the very last time. It's me learning to ride a bike at about 14 years old. Uh, I was the last kid on my block to learn to ride a bike. Uh, and it took a long time, but I finally found my balance. And I encourage you to learn to ride a bike and learn to uh, get back on a bike if that's, uh, you know, if you've been on one before, because it's fun, especially an electric bike. It's good for the environment. It's good for your health. So with that, I'm going to thank Anthony once again. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you to my two regular viewers for watching. And we'll be back with uh, the Two Wheel Revolution in a couple of weeks. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo.